This is season two of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast about Japanese sci-fi mega franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 40 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. We need to start this week with a brief apology. Any of our listeners who were paying close attention last week will have noticed that we called that episode Season 2, Episode 0 on the show. But it was labeled Episode 1 in whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. It turns out that we actually can't assign an episode number less than one. But we only learned that once the episode was already finished. So we are going to say that last episode was actually Season 2, Episode 1, and we'll pretend that was our intention all along. This episode will be Season 2, Episode 2, and we apologize for any confusion that we inadvertently caused. And now, this is Episode 2.2, Back in Black, and we're your hosts. I'm Tom, lifelong Gundam fan, and hey, I understand, at 17, I also had a lot of anger issues. And I'm Nina. I hope y'all are ready for constant commentary on hair and fashion. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 108 patrons. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest patrons, Emery Laserwolf, Buffalo Style, Dylan T, and Carson C. If you'd like to support Mobile Suit Breakdown and get access to our patron discord, bonus content, and more, you can do so at GundamPodcast.com slash Patreon. Another great way to support the podcast is by reviewing us and sharing us with your friends. So this week, I would like to thank Matthew Lin and Shiro45 for writing reviews on iTunes. I'd also like to thank everybody who's been supporting us on Reddit, and in particular, I would like to thank Reddit users Make Good Use Of, Mongoose Ninja 13, Hex Maniac, someone whose name I can't say on the podcast, but it starts with a K and ends with an R, <laughs> as well as Felt2308. Thank you for saying that we are more enjoyable than the show itself. And a big thank you to longtime supporter and Reddit user Bag of Magic Food. I'd also like to thank Little King Trashmouth on Twitter for pointing out correctly that according to the rules we established in the previous episode, we do at some point have to cover Gundam the Ride. What? <laughs> a 2000 era amusement park that had an animated Gundam ride. Fair. Although based on the rules we established, we do have to be able to find <laughs> that video. Oh, Little King Trashmouth sent us a link. <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> I look forward to it. (laughs) Will we be able to survive? It's too bad the ride isn't around anymore. Oh no, we have to go to Japan. (laughs) Oh no, we have to go on this fun Gundam ride. Last week, we talked about the context behind Zeta Gundam. What the world was like when it was made, why it was made. Things like that. This week... We're actually going to talk about Zeta Gundam, episode one. So now, the recap. Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, episode one, The Black Gundam, or Kuroi Gundam. Which means, The Black Gundam. Or a Black Gundam, or... (laughs) (laughs) Space, again. Three mobile suits approach a colony. Elsewhere, a high school karate club is in session, with a senior student demonstrating techniques when everyone is distracted by a call of, I'll be absent today, from outside. A young man named Camille is cutting practice and takes off running. On his way out of the school, the team captain catches him. When Camille claims to be leaving because he isn't feeling well, the captain backhands him. But Camille springs up and continues running off campus. As he runs, a young woman starts calling his name and jogs up beside him, asking him what's going on. 
Stop calling out my name. I don't want people knowing that I'm called Camille, he says, continuing to run. She keeps up with him and replies, Everyone already knows you're the one who doesn't accept it. They continue to run through lush parks until they reach the street, where the two of them hop into a waiting car, then a tram called the Linear Car Service. And it is only after it passes through a series of metal doors that we see we are on a space colony. The Linear Car Service travels along the outside of the cylinder, and Camille stares out the window, smiling for the first time since we met him. Suddenly, he begins to sweat. He senses something, can hear odd sounds like music, and sees three bright, fast-moving lights among the stars. Out in space, Lieutenant Quattro, piloting a red mobile suit, senses something, and wonders if it is Amuro Ray, or perhaps Lala Soon. Camille and his friend arrive at the spaceport, but they are late, and have missed the arrival of the direct shuttle from Earth. Temptation, Captain Bright's vessel. Camille is a fan, and even has Bright's autograph. In a hall of the spaceport, Camille sees a small group dressed mostly in black and red. Titans, he murmurs to himself. His friend calls out, Camille! And one of the Titans, a tall blonde man, hearing them, says to his group, That's a girl's name, but surprise, he's a boy. Camille hears this and snaps. Don't make fun of me, he yells, hopping over a low barricade and punching the blonde Titan in the face. The low gravity of the spaceport launches them in opposite directions. The group of Titans surround their friend, astonished that anyone would pick a fight with them. Camille fights well one-on-one, -on -one, but an MP grabs him from behind while the group of Titans beat him. Lieutenant Quattro infiltrates the colony. He discovers a dusty, seemingly abandoned interior with stinking air and no greenery. He is flying through with a jetpack taking photographs when he spots a hangar and the feet of a mobile suit, just a short distance away, a dock and a ship. Before he can leave, he is spotted by a black mobile suit. Taking photos as he dodges its Vulcan cannons, Quattro gloats that there's no way they'll be able to hit a target as small as him. He escapes the way he came, dodging security, and rendezvous with two more mobile suit pilots who are spying on Camille's nearby colony. They spot another of the black mobile suits, these new Gundams, on a training flight. It is the Mark II, and they had heard rumors about its development. Camille sits handcuffed in a small office, back inside the colony. An MP reviews Camille's file. He wins competitions and tournaments, gets good grades. His record is impressive, and could get him considered for military service. He demands to know if Camille is part of something called the Ayug, and barks that the idea that Ayug is a movement pursuing independent self-governance rights for people living in outer space is a lie. They're a worthless group acting like Xeon and criticizing the people of Earth. Camille remains silent. For a brief moment, he thinks he can see space through the floor of the room, but he's sure he's imagining it. Staring at the twinkling lights and what looks like a shooting star, he is caught off guard when a voice says, You are free to go, Camille Biran. A man in a suit arrives with the MP from before and chides Camille while unlocking the handcuffs. If you were a space noid with no identification, he'd be holding you for four or five days. Camille needles the MP, who chucks his notebook at Camille in response. The man in the suit tries to calm things, but Camille is already springing over the table, landing crouched in front of the MP before jumping up to kick him in the head. He is seized again by two more guards, and the MP he kicked clubs him in the stomach. Suddenly, with a rumble and a roar, the ceiling of the room collapses, sending everyone to the floor. One of the Mark II mobile suits has crashed into the building. Soldiers and military police scramble down the halls, and Camille escapes. As he sprints through the lobby, he dodges his mother, ignoring her calls, and once outside, he steals a soldier's jeep and flees. Crashing through the security checkpoint and about to drive onto a bridge, he sets the car to cruise and jumps out, rolling down the embankment and into the woods. He buries his face in the grass, wondering what he's going to do now. Outside the colony, Quattro and his men signal for help from a nearby ship, the Argama. When it sees their flare, it fires a beam cannon, blasting a hole in the colony. Season 2 begins! So, this being the first episode, we're going to start just by talking about the intro and our general impressions of Zeta in terms of its production. The art, the music, the design, the staff, and the difference between 1979 and 1985 is like night and day. 
Any of you who have been watching along will probably be as struck by this as I was, but Zeta is gorgeous. It's so pretty. So pretty. The animation is incredible. Sharp and detailed and rich. Yeah, I, re <laughs> I really like it. What struck me most is the shadowing, the level of detail that goes into shading and shadowing, especially the mobile suits during the opening is just, it's incredible. It's beautiful. And it's so different from what we encountered in First Gundam. There were a couple of times while we were watching First Gundam when we pointed out, oh, this is an episode that has that really stark cross-hatched shading style that we really like. But that was, you know, four or five episodes out of a 43 episode run. It wasn't very common. Flip side of the same coin, they have a lot of light effects. <laughs> yeah. It feels perhaps like it will be characteristic of Zeta to have these little like bursts of light usually as reflections off of some kind of surface mm -hmm. right off of off of a mobile suit off of a, the windshield of a car mm -hmm. they do a lot with light it has this like prismatic look to it which looks very real also looks very showy like we have just now developed either the technology or the expertise to be able to do this and we're going to do it at crucial moments really emphasize how cool our lighting effects are as longtime listeners know, we watch each episode a couple of times before we sit down to talk about it, usually twice. And the second time through, <laughs> the thing that I murmured to Tom as we watched the intro was, I love the explosion color palette. <laughs> you must have forgotten, but you also said that the first time we watched oh, it. Oh, well, I did It made forget. an immediate, immediate <laughs> impression on you. It's dark gray, medium gray, and orange. Brilliant like orange. Yellowy orange. In First Gundam, the explosions very consistently were pink and purple. Pink yeah. smoke, purple smoke. Lots of pink explosions in space. Which is cool. It looks really cool. But the orange and gray of the explosions in Zeta is very different and really pretty. And the higher contrast is very eye-catching. Yeah, we just talked recently about how few colors were in First Gundam's color palette. And we can already tell that Zeta has a lot more. Higher budget. <laughs> much, much higher budget. And one of the effects of that that I think we're going to see played out throughout the show is Zeta feels muddier with all of the shadowing, with the different lighting effects, the dark, the light, and the in-between, and the much broader palette of colors. First Gundam, things were either bright or they were dark, right? You were either bright primary colors in full sun or very dark shadows. In First Gundam, you knew what was important <laughs> in a scene <laughs> because that was the thing that had detail. Mm -hmm. Everything else was very simple, you know, outlines <laughs> filled in with color. <laughs> uh, we do get a few detailed backgrounds in First Gundam, but they're not as common. And they tend to have a, a painted look that tells us, okay, that's a painted background. Nothing's going to happen in the background that I need to look at. Mm -hmm. Zeta does not allow us that same level of focus. Yeah, there's... So much detail everywhere <laughs> that your eyes and brain don't have that same automatic reaction of, oh, okay, I can ignore this piece of visual information. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how because so much more is being animated, so much more action is happening on screen and is visible that actually I think less stuff happens. There are a lot of parallels between this first episode of Zeta and the first episode of First Gundam, which we will talk about a lot more in a minute. But just as an example, in the first section of both episodes, three mobile suits infiltrate a colony from space. And in First Gundam, all of that happens in less than a minute. Mm -hmm. Three Zaku, they land, they open the door, they go in, they enter the colony. In that same span of time in Zeta... Two mobile suits talk to each other. <laughs> two mobile suits talk to each other, but also Lieutenant Quattro punches some buttons in his cockpit. He looks at various different screens. He makes some faces and goes, hmm. <laughs> and then we get an extensive scene of him and a couple of the other pilots talking a little bit. All of that before they've even gotten to the colony. And then the scene of Lieutenant Quattro actually infiltrating the colony goes on for quite a while after that. Focusing back on things that the intro shows us specifically, not that they don't come up later in the episode, but we get a few shots of the hair. <laughs> and the hair is very different. 
This is a callback to a very early episode of the podcast when Nina noticed that all of the characters in First Gundam really had helmet hair, except occasionally Sela. And one time Fra, when Fra is using the jetpack and flying around. <laughs> um, but yeah, very little hair movement and very little hair texture. The hair is just sort of a, a block. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we see lots of hair movement, lots of hair texture, and creeping into the 80s style a little bit, uh, there is a decidedly mullety look <laughs> to... I'll, I'll use the name the show gives him, but we all know who he is. Quattro's hair. I don't... What are you talking about? You don't sound like you're joking enough. You sound too serious there. I, I am serious. Unfortunately, my prediction about improvements to the butts in the series is going to have to wait until we get clear of the 80s. The 80s were a time <laughs> of skinny hips and no butts. Yep. So big shoulders, though. Yep, that's true. Uh, much sharper features, pointier noses, cheekbones, chins, everything about the way people's faces are drawn feels much sharper mm -hmm. in Zeta than it did in Mobile Suit Gundam. And I was going to say there are a lot taller people, but I think that's just because in Zeta, a lot more of the characters are adults. In First Gundam, basically none of the important characters were full grown people. But in Zeta, with the exception of Camille and his as yet unnamed friend, basically everybody important is an adult. Random 80s fashion note. <laughs> Turtlenecks? Well, we had turtlenecks in the 70s too. They've kept the turtlenecks. But one of the things that struck me right away is that Camille is wearing light colored socks with dark colored pants and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> They're like white or just off white socks <laughs> with really dark pants and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we will see other markers of 80s fashion as we move through. To some degree, even Camille's mom in her broad-shouldered business suit is a very working woman of the 80s. Extremely so. With her very short hair. And, and she's so tall and slender mm -hmm. with the huge shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Camille's mom is an 80s icon. One other note about the intro before we move on from it. Looking at the production credits for the people who are listed in the intro, we now have multiple mecha designers, for one thing, which is definitely something you're going to be able to see in the show, the influence of those very divergent mecha design styles. We also have a new slate of writers, and just under half of them are women. Dang. Yeah. We'll see what impact that has on the story of Zeta, but it's something to keep in mind as we go forward. You said you were done with the intro, but how can we not talk about the Mobile Suit Gundam characters who appear <laughs> in the intro? You just want to crow about the fact that you were basically right. About no, I was totally wrong. I thought a bunch of them weren't going to be <laughs> in the series. And then apparently everybody is but Sela. Well, you thought Bright was coming back. You thought the orphans were coming back. You thought Amuro was coming back. They've all shown up in the intro. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't think Fra or Hayato <laughs> or Kai... And I wasn't sure about Mirai. And all of them are in there. <laughs> Except <laughs> Sela. Where did Sela go? Hmm. That's something we'll have to talk about as we go forward. But Sela is not there for out-of-universe, real-world production reasons. Oh. Yeah. There are a whole bunch of rumors and stories circulating about why Sela is not there. But I don't know if I should just say it. <laughs> <laughs> is there going to be a better time? Um... Yes, there actually is. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on to this one for the better time that's coming up. One last thing I noticed in the intro, the way the music opens feels very reminiscent of the theme from 2001 A Space Odyssey mm -hmm. with the, it sounds like very large drum or timpani dun, dun, coming dun, dun, in. Dun, yeah. Dun. Although Tom informs me this is not the original intro music. It is not. Would you like to hear the original intro music? Kind of. <laughs> Oh, this is much more 80s. Okay. Yeah, this is interesting because the original is much more like what I expected. Yeah. It's got vocals. It feels much more of the time. And this would be included in any Japanese release of Zeta Gundam. But for whatever reason, they can't release it. So it's a little unclear. I need to pin this down. But Neil Sadaka had some role in the creation of this song and... For whatever reason, the copyright situation <laughs> for it is a little bit messed up. 
And so Bandai Sunrise has the copyright for releases of the song in Japan, but not internationally. Mind you, I think the instrumental that they use on American releases is really good. Mm -hmm. It really works. It does. It but fits. you want a theme song people can sing. Speaking of the music, it's so different. So different. It's also very music forward. Mm -hmm. Like in the scenes where the music comes up, the music is the primary thing. And everything else is like set to the music and the music overpowering everything else. Mm -hmm. First Gundam didn't really do that except once when they played Shagakuru <laughs> during that one fight. Yeah, we get a lot of smooth jazz kind of tunes. We get a lot of synth. Mm -hmm. It feels very on trend is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> there was a definite shifting of gears. I highly doubt we're going to get any ballads, for instance. <laughs> Mobile suits. We see two new mobile suits in this episode. There's the one that Quattro and his wingmen use when they're infiltrating the colony. Are they the same? Yes. Okay. Quattro's is just red for some reason. <laughs> some, some reason. The other one has a red face. <laughs> it's true. And then we also see the new Gundam, the Black Gundam. The Mark II. Of which there are three <sighs> units. I like it so much. It's real good. It looks really good. So my, my question about the Mark II is, did Tomino finally get to demand the color scheme that he had always wanted? <laughs> uh, maybe. Fans of the podcast will remember, Tomino had originally wanted the base from the first series to be shades of gray, to blend into outer space. <laughs> well, and he wanted the original Gundam to be like a dark blue. And the sponsors told him no. And he was like, fine, I'm going to give it a stupid name. It's the white base. <laughs> grumble, grumble. And we moved on. Yep. But now... Although, even if he did get the color he wanted on the Gundam, we did see another white base-esque ship at the end of this episode. And it's white. It's white again. They can't give him everything he wants. <laughs> he would get spoiled. With the new mechs, it's a decidedly different shape overall. The, the part that is our stand-in for the head is much smaller. They're much leggier. They feel sharper, more sharp edges, more pointy angles. And yet similar enough to the original Gundam design. I mean, similar in that it's a <laughs> it's a big machine that's shaped vaguely like a person. You're still talking about the Mark II, right? No, I'm talking oh, about the oh, other you're two about guys. The, the other one. I'm sorry. Which I don't know I what we it's called. Still talking about the no, Mark the, II. the Mark II looks so basically like a Gundam. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Mark II is a Gundam with a few details changed and a lick of paint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the other guys. Yeah, the other ones look a bit like a hybrid of like a late era Xeon suit and a Federation mobile suit. They have the angularity of the Federation suits, but then they have the sort of roundedness of the Xeon suits as well. But the tiny head is totally new. Mm -hmm. Tiny pointy head. With mono eye. Gotta have that mono eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they haven't been named in the show yet, but I'll go ahead and tell you, those are Rick Diaz mobile suits. Oh, that's the one everybody likes. Yeah. It's really cool. I it also really like cool. it. They're good looking mobile suits. With both the Mark II and the Rick Diaz, they really do feel like continuations of the same design principles, the same aesthetic that we saw in the mobile suits in First Gundam. They look like evolutions, not like a completely new kind of thing. That's fair. Although to some degree, I feel like to look completely new, they would either have to abandon the humanoid shape entirely or do something very strange with it. No one show her any of the suits from later in Zeta. <laughs> There were a few animation commonalities to Mobile Suit Gundam. We've been talking a lot about things we noticed that were different, but there are things that stayed consistent to the visual style. One, they use color shifts to emphasize scenes where someone is feeling really strong emotion. Yeah. We see this when... Uh, Camille has his freak out. Yeah, when Camille gets insulted by this titan and everything, the whole screen goes another color. It's like a swirling mass of different colors, and Camille is just in outline. It's a really cool effect. 
Similarly, when he has his little new type moment, which <laughs> we're just going to call them that, when he notices the key is still in the ignition of that car outside the military base, everything else goes dark and the key looks almost neon. It like lights up in his perception, which we see happen with Amaro when he finds the... Uh, you had When he's this fighting Kanskan's attack force and he sees Kanskan's ship trying to ram the white base and he, can, he has a new type of moment and he sees the precise two places on the ship where if he sticks his beam saber, it'll, the whole thing will explode. Yeah. So Tom, being very clever and smart, <laughs> noticed that there are a lot of parallels in this first episode of Zeta to the first episode of Mobile Suit Gundam, which I hadn't noticed at all until he mentioned it. And then once he mentioned it, I couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the first time that they are making a Gundam sequel. It's the first time they're making a Gundam show knowing that they're making a Gundam show. And they don't yet know that this is going to be a 40 year long mega franchise, but they do know that it is the sequel to a hugely successful first show. Eventually, hugely successful first show. <laughs> and when they first started making this, they were envisioning Gundam 2, right? Gundam the second part, Gundam the sequel. And this first episode opens in a very similar fashion to the way First Gundam opened. From the overall structure of the story, you have three mobile suits infiltrating a colony where a secret new mobile suit and secret new warship are being developed. You have a scolding girl chasing down a boy, and then they both jump into a car. Yep, and the boy is driving, and the boy clearly has some emotional problems. He's also a whiz kid. Amaro built his own computer, but he built his own Haro. Camille has won the like human flying machine and junior mobile suit tournaments two years in a row. They both do something rude that the girl then scolds them for. <laughs> Amaro eats while driving. Camille is biting his fingernails. And although I don't think Amuro did this in the first episode, Amuro did have a habit of chewing on his thumb, just like Camille, whenever he was particularly anxious. Yup, I noticed that. And I think Fra did have a tendency to scold him for it. But this also comes through in small little visual references, like when Lieutenant Quattro opens the door to get into the colony initially, there's a little like piece of space pipe that is just inside and when the door opens it like makes a clang noise and flies out into space. Same thing happens at the beginning of First Gundam. And the fact that the hatchway opens over kind of like a mountainous area, mm -hmm. that's the same in both. Mm -hmm. This bit comes from the second episode of First Gundam, but Lieutenant Quattro flying around with his jetpack and his little handheld uh, spy camera mm -hmm. while being shot at is very similar to when Char was flying around with his handheld spy camera and jetpack while being shot at. One might almost say deja vu. We're clearly meant to see Quattro and be reminded of Char. <laughs> oh, and episode one of Zeta Gundam also ends with a hole being blown in the side of the colony, just like the first Gundam. So let us now move on to talking about the world as we can see it in these brief little bits of world building that Zeta sneaks in around the edges because we have returned to that very classic Gundam style of storytelling where they're not going to tell you anything. You just have to figure it out as you go along. There's not even an intro narration. I think we actually learn a lot about the world that they live in in this episode, but you have to really think about <laughs> the little bits and pieces mm -hmm. or it doesn't sink in. Mm -hmm. I, for one, wasn't sure that we were in space until Camille and unnamed girl <laughs> get into that... Uh, linear car is what they call them. Yeah. Well, they get into the linear car, which is on the outside of the cylinder. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're in space. Gotcha. Yep. Their environment within the colony looks very beautiful, but then gets contrasted to the facility that Quattro <laughs> breaks into. Mm -hmm. Which is gross. It's really ugly. Well, he the first thing he says when he opens the hatches, it stinks. Yeah. We get the impression of pollution, of grime. We know from his comments it was built out of scrap from destroyed Xeon colonies. Mm-hmm. 
but it looks dense, right? It looks as if at one point it was full of facilities and maybe it still is. Maybe this is specifically a like factory facility. And so it's all production and it's horribly polluted, but it is, it's one of the first environments of that kind we've seen. Mm -hmm. and actually, it's the first with the exception of <laughs> some environments in First Gundam that we get the impression uh, have experienced severe desertification. Mm -hmm. That's the closest we get to environmental damage in First Gundam. It's never explicitly stated in the show, and so it can be a little bit confusing until you figure out that there are actually two different colonies in play here. Right. These that, are separate spaces. Yeah, that Quattro has infiltrated one colony and that I think it's Lieutenant Apoli or maybe it's Lieutenant Roberto, whichever. One of the wingmen is using a camera to infiltrate the other colony. And so the one that Quattro is flying around in with Gundam Mark II Unit 1 is a different colony from the one that Camille is in, which has the other two Mark IIs, Units 2 and 3. Green Noah 2? I think you're supposed to call it Grips. So I think Camille is in Green Noah 1 and Quattro is in Green Noah 2. Okay. Are they named for Bright? I really want them to be named for Bright. I have never gotten a good answer to that question. <laughs> it haunts me to this day. He's the only Noah we know. Well, maybe. I mean, we know he comes from an elite family on Earth. That's true. We'll loop back around to the name thing because it's fun for us to joke about it, but it actually is very revealing <laughs> Yeah, in the world, world of the show. The colony where Camille lives seems really nice. It's pretty densely populated. It's a nice mixture of like urban, suburban development, but also lots of nature spaces. People at his school are all like dressed for leisure. There are some girls in tennis whites carrying what look like badminton rackets. There's the whole quite large martial arts club. This is a normal, peaceful, prosperous colony. And it feels just full of people. In a way that Side 7 back in Mobile Suit Gundam never did. Side 7 felt small and depopulated and largely Incomplete. deserted. <laughs> you want to know something nuts? Obviously. Green Noah 1, where Camille lives, mm -hmm. that's Side 7. <gasps> oh, how cool and crazy. Yeah, they repaired it, rebuilt Made it. Made it better. Finished it, populated it, and now somebody else blew a hole in the side of it again. <laughs> it's cursed. <laughs> If that happens one more time, they should maybe just abandon <laughs> abandon this particular project. <laughs> and Green Noah 2, aka Grips, is a colony that is new built in the Side 7 colony zone. It was not there previously. We talked quite a lot about physical violence in the previous series because it was so shocking when it happened, when it was person on person rather than machine v machine. When Bright slaps Amuro, when Bright punches Kai, when Ryu punches Kai. These are shocking moments. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of, <laughs> of hits mm -hmm. in this one episode. The first one being the judo club captain. I think it's judo. It looks like judo. It's their judo uniforms, but what then they're doing looks a lot more like karate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the captain just sort of nonchalantly slapping Camille across the face hard enough that Camille goes sprawling mm -hmm. and Camille takes off. And that's just the first <laughs> incident in Camille's very bad day. It's really the introduction to Camille is him skipping class, well, skipping his club practice at this martial arts club and getting backhanded by his senpai, by the club captain. When I say that these things become very revealing the more you think about them, what I mean is think for a moment about Camille's reaction to that first hit and compare it to Amuro's reaction mm -hmm. to his first hit. And maybe that tells you a lot about them as individuals, but maybe it tells you a lot about the world that they are growing up in. Por que no los dos? So we'll come back to that when we talk in depth about Camille specifically, but think for a moment about the kind of world where a young man gets hit like that and it's totally normal to him and he just takes it in stride and keeps going. It's two sentences of Camille and unnamed girl <laughs> arguing about whether or not Bright is a new type. <laughs> 
Uh, but it's established from the beginning. People know, average people know what new types are to some degree. They may not totally understand what new types are, but they know that they exist and are special. So that's common knowledge in the world we're in. Yeah, and the show lets us know that new type stuff is going to be real important right off the bat. We get Camille having plenty of what are obviously undeniably new type moments throughout the episode. As I've pointed out before, in terms of reading a show, reading what's going to be important, what the point of it all is, the first episode and the last episode are especially important because the first episode in a lot of ways lays out what the thesis of the show is going to be. And sometimes they do a little bit of trickery by giving you a thesis and then inverting it later. We'll see if that happens. But right off the bat, the show is telling us one, new type stuff is going to be crucial. Two, this show is going to engage with the legacy of First Gundam directly. Mm -hmm. That's what all those references do. That's what the appearance of Captain Bright tells us. And then three, this show is going to be directly engaging with space noid rights and the oppression of space noids and the role of Earth in the Earth sphere in a way that First Gundam never did. Yeah. In First Gundam, we get a handful of offhand comments about things like the elites are the ones who live on Earth that power, political power, is concentrated on Earth, that there is a sense from the colonists who live out on the various sides that they don't have enough right to self-governance, that their voices are not being heard by the central government. But that's it. We know there's some discontent, and we know that that at least helped spark Zeon's move for first independence and then dominance. <laughs> <laughs> but both in the show and in the world, the principality of Zeon's fascism and the Zabi family's thirst for power hijacked that space noid rights movement, took it over and replaced it with their own ambitions, their own thirst for power and glory. So if the show starts off with us thinking, oh, there's going to be a whole thing about the elites on Earth and the space noids out in space. But no, in fact, it was Zobbies. It was always Zobbies. <laughs> the Zobbies grabbed that idea and strangled it for their own glory. But now the Zobbies are gone for the most part. And it really does seem like space noid rights are going to be front and center for Zeta. We see clear examples of the infringement on that. You know, Camille is questioned by a very belligerent MP, just say a member of the military police, uh, and is informed later when he's about to be let out that, oh, if you didn't have connections, he'd have kept you here for days. Yeah, like a week. If you were just a regular space noid. And there's no sign that he's been given or offered a lawyer. And he's a minor, and there's no sign that they have attempted to contact his parents or are going to wait for his parents to arrive before they question him. And that doesn't even include the, like, obvious abuses of him being beaten <laughs> by police and soldiers on multiple occasions. Yep. Uh, this is a world in which any criticism of Earth is suspect. Any criticism of the ruling power makes you automatically a rebel and a revolutionary. It's a world where military service is held up as the most prestigious and best possible job that you can have. Yeah, during the interrogation, they look at Camille's records and they say, wow, you're really smart. You're really talented. You've achieved all these things. Why, you could be in the army if you wanted to be. And that is a comment that really sets Camille off. If you didn't have such an attitude problem. He's very obstinate. He's very closed down throughout that whole interrogation, except right in that moment when the guy says, you could be in the army with these sorts of grades. Like Camille flinches. It clearly strikes a nerve with him. And we'll talk more about why that is, because I have a whole theory about Camille's personality, and that scene is the linchpin for it. It was while watching that for the, I don't know, fourth or fifth time that this idea crystallized for me. A quick note about the world before we move on. Bright is flying some sort of transport shuttle. Which seems like maybe peaceful and nice, but m maybe a serious demotion? I mean, he's the captain, but... Yeah. Second, this will lead us into our discussion of the Titans, but there's something called the AUG, the A-E-U-G, which the military police officer interrogating Camille is very concerned that he may be a member of or a sympathizer for. And all we know about them is that they are a group which claims to be fighting for spacenoid independence, but which this military police officer says is really just criticizing the people on Earth. We're clearly meant to think that he is 
full of it. Because he, he he doesn't even present anything terrible they're doing. He doesn't claim that they're terrorists. He doesn't claim anything bad about them, really, except that they are critical of the Earth government. Well, and he does say they're acting like Xeon, whatever that means. Yeah, unclear what's meant by that. It just makes me think that Xeon went and ruined it. Xeon went and ruined Spacenoid independence movements for everybody. Can I just say the Titans are coded as villains from the get-go? Those oh, uniforms, yeah. it's black and red. Or like dark blue and blood red. Yeah. They look like baddies. They do. Sharp, though. <laughs> Actually, uh, what I noticed about the uniforms on our second watch through is how disparate they are. No two members of the Titans are wearing the same uniform, which I think is significant. But I'm going to need to do some research and come back to that. They are clearly subject to special treatment. They clearly think they are above the rules. And, well, I say think they are. They are. They are simply not subject to the same rules and controls as other people or even other people in the military. There is that line when Camille first punches Jared, when someone's like, are you picking a fight with us, even knowing that we are Titans? And then they proceed to attack him. Well, and not just attack him, a group of adult soldiers beat a teenage boy. Yes, while he's restrained. Yeah, a couple of them restrain him and a couple of them beat him. And Jared kicks him in the forehead. So there's that. So like you were saying, they're the villains. Similarly, when Camille is being held by the police, at one point he hits the MP. But again, you're a trained adult. This is a teenage kid. And he proceeds to have two people hold Camille while he hits him in the gut with a baton. Yeah, it's definitely a world where the violence is endemic. And this violence feels very different from the violence in First Gundam, because in First Gundam, the interpersonal violence was all... Personal. Yeah. This is institutional. Yes. And in First Gundam, it was essentially, it was between friends. It was violence. I'm trying to figure out how exactly to characterize it. It's not that there were no power dynamics, because obviously, if, if Bright is Amaro's commanding officer, then there's some power dynamics there. Mm-hmm. But it's a mediator for managing these personal relationships, mm -hmm. as opposed to in Zeta, all the violence feels like beating down the underclasses, reestablishing <sighs> the control of the people in power. And it's always, it's revenge. But it's revenge times 10, right? Yeah, yeah. You hit me once, so I'm going to me hit and you my, five times. Me and my buddies. Yeah. So that you learn never to hit an MP or a Titan again. Right. And for Camille, it's just this like, it's like ball of rage. Like Camille is pure rage and he just has to strike out at these oppressive institutions. And then every time he does, he gets literally beaten down. I'm really glad we watched it a second time because the first time my immediate reaction as a person who has always been like conflict avoidant and very cautious is like, this kid has no impulse control. This kid has no plan, solves all his problems with punching, constantly lashing out. You're not wrong about those things. Well, but you have to see the events of this first episode as... Not singular. You have to see the events of these first episodes and think this has been Camille's whole life. Yes. That this is not the first time he's been beaten by soldiers. This is not the first time he's had to deal with constant belittling and disrespect. You know, you'd think he would get used to the fact that people make fun of him for being named Camille. Uh, there's a song called Boy Called Sue. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are familiar. <laughs> yeah, but the, the whole point of Boy Called Sue is that he fights constantly. Yep. It makes him a like limitless ball of incandescent rage. So I guess we have to check when that song is from. <laughs> <laughs> and think about Camille's anger as being a response to living in this oppressive system Yeah, that has been treating him and his friends horribly his entire life. And Camille is a relatively privileged space noid. We can see that, you know, as, as said, he's got papers, he's got connections. His mom comes to pick him up when he's in military detention. But that can't be true for all of his friends. That's not true for the people he sees around him. Camille's eyes are open to the inherent injustices of this system and the violence that runs through at every level of it. And of course, he has impulse control issues. He's like 16 or whatever. He's a teenager. He lives in an inherently violent system. He 
sees all of these systems of oppression. He sees all of these injustices and he lashes out. He strikes out. And every time he does, he gets beaten down and it gets worse. He becomes more angry, not less. Which brings me to something I am very ashamed to admit, which is when Tom had me making predictions about Zeta, somehow I did not anticipate or even think about the fact that we might get what is effectively a uh, colonial disintegration, post-colonial kind of story. Because after World War II, lots and lots of colonies got their independence, some through violent means, some through nonviolent means. For some, it happened very quickly. For some, it took decades. But there were a lot of <laughs> independence movements in the years after World War II. And the overwhelming feeling Tom and I got watching this episode was that we are looking at like a colonial military police force interacting with a local population. And that is a theme we are going to come back to again and again and again throughout this show. It's going to come up in a lot of our research. So I hope you are as interested in it as we are. I think it might be one of the major themes. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe. Yeah. You know, I thought of apartheid to some degree. Tom thought of Ireland. In First Gundam, we have a lot of evidence that the whole show is a metaphor for World War II, for Japan's participation in it, and that that was intentional from the very beginning on Tomino's part. There is not the same sort of general consensus about Zeta. So going into it, I spend a lot of time trying to research and figure out what are we talking about? What is this an allegory for? And I knew it had to be something. Tomino has said over and over again that he takes all of his good story ideas from real life. So I know that Zeta references something or some things. And as I was researching, you know, who are the Titans supposed to be? What conflict are we really looking at? The fact is there are a multiplicity of these sorts of conflicts. We're not talking about one thing. We are referencing a hundred of these. And they tend to play out along the same sort of lines when you write the narrative of one of these independence movements, lines that I think we are going to see in Zeta. The other notion that popped into my head as we were watching, and that I cannot confirm yet, because while we have met Quattro and Ayug, we have not yet seen what Amuro is up to, but that based on how Amuro seemed at the end of Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta might set up Amuro and Shaquatro. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a new kind of razor blade. <laughs> the Shaquatro. Um, four blades for a close shave. But that the show might set up the two of them as the uh, classic counterpoints of the nonviolent and violent independence movement, the nonviolent and violent movement for the rights of an oppressed group of people. We shall see. We see one interaction between Camille and his mother in this episode, and it's when she shows up to pick him up and she sees him across the room and calls out to him and he sees her and he continues running. <laughs> and I just thought, mother complex V2. <laughs> yep. See? Conscious references to First Gundam. I also thought it was an interesting choice that they kept him high school aged, even though they know that a lot of the fan base skews older. They know from First Gundam, a lot of the fan base is college aged. Mm -hmm. Some high school as well. It's definitely not, it's not elementary or junior high, really. Uh, but they kept the protagonist around the same age. But they did age up the rest of the cast. So I think the, the understanding that Gundam is more of a show for older people did influence the creation of Zeta Gundam in that way. Keeping in mind all of the similarities, all the conscious references between First Gundam and Zeta, we should also remember the differences, particularly the differences between Amuro and Camille. Because while they have some similarities, they are very different people. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to say this in its unadulterated form because both Tom and I had this reaction and he can bleep me. But Camille just loves space. He loves space so much. <laughs> we never see Amuro lash out in that way. No. Amuro's not a violent person in the way Camille is. Amuro is ultimately forced to do a lot of violence, and he's very good at it. But you never get the sense that Amuro wants to solve his problems by hurting people. Also, I just want to point out, Camille is actually really good at fighting. Oh, yeah. He's slick. I'm jealous of his moves. He keeps getting ganged up on. <laughs> but if it weren't for that, yeah. 
He pulls off a nice little slip uppercut combo when he's fighting the Titans, and then he has a really good head kick against that MP. Only towards the very end of our second watch through of this episode did I start to put together my theory of Camille, which I'm going to share with you right now. We know Camille is a privileged space noid. We know that he comes from a family with connections within the military. We know that Camille is a talented pilot. He's won the Homo Avis Challenge, which is like a human flight suit kind of thing. We know that he's won the Junior Mobile Suit Challenge. He is a bright Noah fanboy. He loves space and he like skips class, goes out of his way. He's so anxious that he's not going to get to watch Bright's shuttle arrive. He has Bright's autograph and not just Bright, but he seems like he might be a one year war white base fanboy, but definitely Bright. And in the episode, we see two things really get to Camille. The first one is the meme, right? Oh, Camille is a girl's name, whatever. Like that clearly sets him off. That triggers him first. But then when he's in the interrogation, it's when the MP says, with marks like these, you could have been eligible for military service. That's the other thing that really sets Camille off. We also know he's a violent person and that he does this martial art after school. I think until very recently, Camille wanted nothing more than to join the army. However, something you need to know about the army in Zeta Gundam is that the army is effectively subordinate to the Titans, and the Titans only take people who were born on Earth. And so here you have this incredibly talented, incredibly smart, hardworking kid who wants nothing more than to join the army and be like his hero, Bright Noah. And yet, whatever he does, no matter how hard he works, where he goes, nothing is going to make up for the fact that he was born in space and not on Earth. He can't be a Titan. He'll never, ever be able to overcome the circumstances of his birth the misfortune of his birth, if you will, and his name, the name that he hates, the name that he was given at birth, is a metaphor for all of that. This week, we research and discuss animation history and technology in the early 80s, and Neil Sadaka and Zeta transcending copyright. The first thing that strikes you watching the beautiful opening sequence of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam is the jump in quality from the previous series. My mouth was hanging open. <laughs> and the intro sequence is definitely better animated than the rest of the show, but the show itself is astonishing compared to first Gundam. There were a lot of factors that contributed to this. Gundam was a proven property, and so Zeta was probably given a lot more resources, money, and staff. We already have that anecdote about how they were permitted a much larger color palette <laughs> than first Gundam. <laughs> Tom found a note that the team at Sunrise that animated Zeta was their best team. But on top of these points, this was a time when there were significant advances in animation technology. As a warning, this is one of those research pieces where every few minutes I came across some new term or piece of technology that I wanted to explain. So there are some digressions. <laughs> <laughs> digressions in Mobile Suit Breakdown? <laughs> and some things that I don't explain here, but that we might get to later. Uh, with that, let's talk animation technology. The very first computer-generated animations appeared in the 60s. A vector animation of a car driving down a highway an animated line drawing of a hummingbird, and an animation of a cat, which was notable as the movement physics were determined by an algorithm, which then allowed the computer to produce many of the images for the sequence. Oh. One of the biggest drivers of the development of computer animation through the 70s was, surprise, surprise, military applications. The U.S. government made financing available for the development of interactive flight and space simulations, and many early advances were at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as various United States universities. In the U.S. and Canada, computer graphics started to show up on TV, but not as full animations. They were commonly used to add station call letters, ABC, NBC, etc., to promos. The first use of computer-assisted animation in a major film was in 1973's Westworld. Huh. 1972 saw the introduction of the Antics 2D animation software, a vector-based 2D animation and graphic design application. A quick aside to define vector. 
Vector images are in contrast to what are called raster image types, like JPEG, GIF, etc., which are made up of a grid of pixels. In a vector image, a series of points are connected by paths, which are determined mathematically. So point A and point B have set locations on an XY axis of an image, but the points in between do not. They are determined by an equation. What this means is that vector images scale without losing resolution. You can make them larger or smaller without graininess or loss of quality. So anyway, Antics still exists, but when it was first released, I would like you to listen to what was involved in creating animation with it. You would trace a drawing onto a computer drawing board, so the computer could convert the drawing into a punched paper tape. You would type data for the desired animation effects into punch cards. Uh, for those of you who are not nerds about computer history or are too young to have ever seen a punch card, punch cards were cardstock or heavy paper with holes in them that would give older computers data to process or program commands. A single program could require thousands of cards. I read one anecdote that the limit on program size was typically one box <laughs> of punch cards because carrying more than one box was completely unwieldy. So about 2,000 cards, which was about one box, which was also, incidentally, about what would fit in the hopper <laughs> of the computer. And you didn't want to have to manually feed cards. So ideally, your program <laughs> would be no more <laughs> than 2,000 commands. For any of our listeners who are computer programmers, just try to imagine programming something with only 2,000 commands. <laughs> so anyway, you would make a bunch of punch cards for any effects the two wanted. Your paper tape and your punch cards would then be fed into the computer, the program would analyze them, and it would print the result on magnetic tape, which was standard video technology at the time. I'm sure we'll talk about that more when we talk about the importance of like OVAs and VHS releases. <laughs> Uh, you could then take the magnetic tape and use it to plot the animation onto 35 millimeter film. But you weren't done yet, <laughs> because this would produce black and white film only. The color system was originally Technicolor based. Antics is actually an acronym for Animated Technicolor Image Computer System. This meant that you needed three different films for red, green, and blue, and then you would combine them into a full color animation. <laughs> Needless to say, big strides since then. <laughs> As computers have gotten more powerful and less expensive, they have been used for many different parts of the traditional animation process. A fabulous history of animation textbook by Gian Alberto Bendazzi describes studios using computer animation to create better images, better overall animated films, and reduced production costs. Computers at the time could be used to produce in between, uh, the images between keyframes, to ink and or color hand-drawn images that have been scanned into a program, and to plot layouts and character movements for traditional animation, all of which saved a lot of time and money, meaning better results could be achieved in the same amount of production time. By the way, whether it's done by a computer or by hand, creating the in-between animation is called tweening. <laughs> We've talked a lot about shows that were effectively 30-minute toy commercials. Well, the 1980s were the heyday for this sort of thing in the United States. But first, a fun fact. When do you think the first toy commercial aired on US TV, and what toy was it for? She's saying this as though it's a question for me, but she already told me, so... <laughs> first hint, it was a Hasbro toy. Star Wars. Wait, no. Transformers. <laughs> Wait, G.I. Joe. I'm giving them a minute in case they want to try to guess. So, the first toy commercial aired on US TV in 1955, and it was for Mr. Potato Head. Although another source I looked at said it was actually Mattel's Burp Gun, also in 1955. I looked up these ads on YouTube, and I'll link to them in the show notes. The Burp Gun is a, a little cap gun. It's a Western-style pistol. I find the ad very disturbing because it shows a small child, like, carefully assembling their ammunition and loading this very realistic, in black and white, looking little gun. But anyway, and did you know that the original Mr. and Mrs. Potato Heads were just the features? You were supposed to stick them on an actual potato. <laughs> you had to su potato not included. <laughs> supply your own potato. I suppose that allows for a certain amount of creativity. You could supply a potato of almost any shape. Well, and in the ad, somebody uses a carrot. 
get creative with what vegetables. That is an unlicensed third party <laughs> application. Did you have to jailbreak your Mr. Potato Head accessories to put them in a carrot? Maybe sharpen them so that they would actually <laughs> stick into the carrot. Now I'm wondering how sharp those little pegs were. Oh, I bet they were super sharp. <laughs> Remember, this is when they were selling those cap guns that actually shot little projectiles to yeah. kids. In 1975, the FCC issued a policy statement banning these program-length commercials, which were mostly an attempt to get around the FCC limits on advertising during children's programming. The limits at that time were 10 and a half minutes of advertising per hour on weekends and 12 minutes of advertising per hour on weekdays. And then in 1981, Ronald Reagan appointed Mark S. Fowler head of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and he began to dismantle all of the regulations around TV advertising. The old limits on ads in children's TV were completely gone by 1984. In addition to an increase in advertising and an increase in programming as advertising, toy makers would also cut deals with TV stations. If you air our show and give it a good time slot, we will give you X percent cut of the profit from toy sales. Things like that. Mm. Not shady at all. <laughs> Moral hazard. <laughs> in 1984 and 85, the number of animated programs featuring licensed characters increased by 300 percent. Wow. When Congress would try to reinstate the limits on advertising in children's television in 1988, Reagan would veto it. Congress passed this measure overwhelmingly, by the way. Hmm. I tried to find specific information about the programming environment and regulation in Japan's children's programming at this time and found two great resources. First, an interesting analysis of children's programs worldwide done by NHK and including more detail on the history of children's TV. Early animated shows in Japan, especially the first one, Mighty Adam, were so successful that by the early 1960s, all commercial TV channels were airing animated shows. It was common for popular ones to air at 5 and 6 p.m., but unlike in other markets, in Japan these shows also aired in the primetime 7 p.m. slot. From the 1960s through the 70s, the amount of children's programming, animated and live action, increased steadily, peaking in the mid-80s, and declined fairly steeply from then for reasons we will get into later. <laughs> Second, the seminal animation history textbook, Cartoons, 100 Years of Cinema Animation, by Gian Alberto Pentazzi, provides some additional detail on this history. From the introduction of anime until 1976, 200 anime were produced. By 1983, so just seven years later, that number had doubled. Ooh. There were more than 10,000 professional animators just in Tokyo. Although there probably were not that many outside of Tokyo. I know Kyoto and Osaka also had an anime industry. Well, and many studios, such as Toei Animation, had even more employees in their South Korean subsidiaries. Hmm. Mass production had taken off. While Bendazzi doesn't specifically address regulation, his description of the typical process behind a show's creation tells us everything we need to know <laughs> about government and industry attitudes toward advertisements in children's programming. To quote Bendazzi's book, production usually followed this routine. The television broadcasters would sell their programming time to advertising agencies, which in turn would find sponsors among the manufacturers of toys, candies, or other products for children. Finally, animated films would be set up on the basis of marketing needs and would then be commissioned to a production company. Hmm. If, for some reason, you are the sort of person who looks at the copyright notices on Gundam series, you will notice that in addition to Bandai and Sunrise and everyone you would expect to be there, there's also a company called Sotsu Agency. Sotsu Agency is an advertising agency. I wonder what they're doing there. And that's me done. You know, I and a lot of people from my generation really love those mid-80s toy commercial cartoons. I admit it. I love them. But looking back, I really have to think the world would be a better place if they didn't exist. If those rules had never been done away with. Animation as an art form and as a media clearly recovered. A lot of histories talk about this as kind of a low point <laughs> for animation. Uh, but they also point out indie animation benefited in some ways. There were 
a lot of animators working through advertising agencies who did personal projects on their own time with the equipment that their jobs gave them access to, who learned that they could do very compelling animations in very short formats, that you could do something really interesting in 30 seconds because they were used to working in those advertising slot times. Well, and art has always been... Commercial. <laughs> art has always been commercial. Art has always been for the benefit of whoever is paying for it. And in the Middle Ages, that was wealthy aristocrats. And now that's corporations. Tom shrugged mightily. <laughs> it creates different art. That's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. And now the segment that I am calling Neil Sadaka and Zeta, Transcending Copyright. Okay. Who is ready for a deep dive on the history of copyright law and international music licensing contract disputes? Wait, no, come back. I promise this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I promise this is going to be interesting. But before we start, a quick disclaimer. I do not practice copyright law. I am not trained in Japanese law, and none of what I am about to say is or should be regarded as legal advice of any kind. <laughs> Highly necessary disclaimer. <laughs> One of the more well-known but poorly understood bits of trivia around Zeta Gundam is that three songs from the show's original soundtrack, and not insignificant ones, have been replaced for all international releases. These are Zeta Tokyo Koete, Zeta Transcending Time, the show's first opening, Mizu no Hoshi e Ai o Komete, From the Aqueous Star with Love, the show's second opening, and Hoshizora no Believe, Believe in the Beautiful Sky, the show's only ending song. The circumstances surrounding these three songs are the same, but Tokyo Koete is the most famous, so I'm going to mostly be referring to that one. The new music that they've put in does fit quite well, but if you happen to have seen the Japanese version of Zeta in the past, perhaps via an imported VHS tape or, you know, some other kind of way, you might be puzzled by the change from the iconic opening song that you remember. If you were curious enough to go looking for an answer, it would not take you long to encounter that dreaded phrase, removed due to copyright issues. And I imagine for most people that's when your eyes start to glaze over and you start thinking about something more pleasant, like a root canal or a big family dinner where you're sitting next to that uncle who holds those political opinions that you hate. But I actually find copyright law fascinating, so I tried to dig a bit deeper. I wanted to know exactly what kinds of copyright issues were dogging Zeta Gundam, and just how had Sunrise gotten themselves into this particular pickle. This wasn't easy. Everyone knows the three songs were removed, sure, and everyone agrees that it was for copyright reasons, but there's precious little to be found beyond that. I therefore would like to thank Mike Toole of Anime News Network, who was good enough to share some of his recollections of conversations with Bandai employees from around when Zeta was first being released in the United States in the early 2000s. This segment would not have been possible without his help. There is still some speculation here, but thanks to him, it is informed speculation. <laughs> Now, let's get started with an abbreviated explanation of just what copyright law is and how it functions before we dive into its application in this particular field and this particular case. I'm going to keep this brief and to the point, and I promise not to quote case law at you, even though there is a really good one about Monty Python. <laughs> Copyright is a legal system in effect all over the world, albeit with small differences in the specifics from one country to the next, that governs the rights that authors possess in the works that they create. Fundamentally, it is the right to make copies of a thing, and it starts out being exclusively possessed by the author, and then they can assign it to whoever they want. It started out way back in 1556 in England as a way to regulate who could print books in order to prevent the spread of Protestantism. Really. This was back when religious reformers were first starting to take advantage of the early printing presses, and the English crown was extremely worried about unlicensed printing presses. <laughs> so if you wanted to print a book, you had to be a licensed printer and you had to register the book with the crown. Then you, the printer who registered it, had the exclusive right to print that book forever. This was effectively a monopoly for the members of the Stationers Guild, because they were the only ones who could register books with the crown. That monopoly outlasted the ban on independent printing presses, and eventually the fact that anybody could obtain the means to print books ran headlong into the Stationers Guild monopoly on the legal printing of books. The inevitable legal dust-up happened, and the result was a new law called the Statute of Anne, issued in 1710. 
For the very first time, authors, and not printers, were legally granted the copyright in their work, based on the rather progressive idea that all of society benefits when ingenious people publish their work, and the best way to encourage them to publish more work, which, again, benefits all of society, is to give them the legal protections necessary to benefit from the publication of their work. And that, both the idea of giving the author rights over their work and the justification for it, went on to be the foundation of modern copyright throughout the world. I have a particular fondness for the way this idea is expressed in the US Constitution, because, yeah, copyright is built into the Constitution itself. So I'm going to read it for you now. This is from Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution. Congress shall have the power to promote the progression of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. I have been talking mostly about the US and UK, but copyright is an international system. In fact, most countries today are party to the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works, a multilateral treaty that provides for automatic copyright protections in all Berne Convention countries for works created by an author from any Berne Convention country. Japan has been party to the convention since 1899, so its copyright laws are substantially in line with the rest of the world. Oh, wow, it's older than I would have expected. Super old, yeah. <laughs> it was actually largely inspired by Victor Hugo. Cool. Yeah. The U.S., however, didn't sign on to the convention until 1988. What? <laughs> yeah. The U.S. actually has a long history of going its own way when it comes to copyright. We're kind of a rogue in that respect. Luckily, the differences between U.S. and Japanese law, while they're very important and on a conceptual theoretical level, they're actually quite far apart. In practical application, especially here, they're pretty similar. What is relevant, though, is the difference in how certain aspects of music copyright are managed in the two countries. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Copyright has grown over the years to be a beast of incredible complexity, largely because of changes in technology and changes in what kinds of works get copyright has led to an explosion of different kinds of copyright protection that were unimaginable in prior eras. It's easy to write laws to control the reproduction of paper books, but just think about accessing a simple website. How many copies of the text on the site need to be made just to transmit it from its home server through the tangle of the internet to your ISP's server, to your modem, to your router, to your computer? <laughs> Here's another more relevant problem. Musical compositions have been protected, at least under US copyright law, since 1831. But there was no law governing public performances of those compositions until 1897. Laws governing recordings of music wouldn't come until much later. And music has remained a thorny issue for copyright ever since, and it only gets worse when you start getting into more complex situations, like when you have music that was composed by one author, performed by a second. That performance is recorded and edited by a third person. And of course, some songs have multiple composers, or multiple artists on the recording, or they may be edited by multiple producers. Any one of those copyright holders could die and pass their rights on to multiple heirs. So, say now you want to sample a few seconds of a song for your own record. But to do that legally, you now have to track down every single one of those rights holders and get them to okay your proposed use. And you probably have to pay each one off along the way, assuming that you can even find them all. And any one of them could just say no, and then you'd be out of luck. <laughs> You can see how this would quickly become completely unworkable. So the music industry in the US and around the world developed a solution in the form of copyright collectives. In the US, these are called performing rights organizations. You'll sometimes hear them called copyright clearinghouses. What they do is they represent huge numbers of artists, composers, performers, etc. And they manage their copyrights for them, collecting and passing on the royalties and, and then enforcing copyright against any violators. This means you don't need to negotiate with 12 artists to get all of the necessary rights to one song. You just negotiate with the one or two performing rights organizations that represent all 12 artists. Convenient, except that PROs, performing rights organizations, in the US do not handle two very important categories of copyright. Adaptation rights, which in music is often called arrangement, and includes the right to, say, translate the lyrics of a song into another language, or change the way it is played. And synchronization rights, and that's the right to combine the music with a moving picture, like an animation. In the US, you have to get those rights from the copyright owner or owners or their representatives, so the artist, or more commonly, the music publisher. And if an artist cares a lot about what changes get made to their work, then they can hold on to those rights, and they can only license projects when they want to. By now you can maybe see where I'm starting to go with this. 
all three of the songs that were pulled from Zeta's soundtrack before it was released in the US were adaptations of songs originally written by Neil Sedaka. Sadaka is one of those pop singer-songwriters whose career has lasted from the 1950s until today. Literally today, he's playing a concert in San Diego tonight. He has had hits like Stairway to Heaven, but not that one, <laughs> Calendar Girl, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, and Next Door to an Angel in the early 60s. Those are all the ones that I recognized. There are some others from later on, but that was really the peak of his career. He floundered in the mid and late 60s, thanks largely to the Beatles, and so he did what many struggling American musicians have done, and he went abroad, performing primarily in the UK and Australia. In 1975, with Elton John's support, he enjoyed a brief career resurgence, but by 1978 he was struggling again. He changed record labels several times, but his albums in the 80s performed poorly. In 1986, he was dropped by another label, and for the next 20 years after that, he self-published all of his works on his own label, Neil Sedaka Records. If Gundam had been made in the US, it would have been necessary for Sunrise to get a license from Sadaka or his publishers to adapt his songs before they made Tokyo Koete or the other two. He might have insisted on input or approval of the final product before it could be used in Zeta. But in Japan, at least in 1985, the situation was different. Because you see, Japan does not have mere performing rights organizations the way the US does. Japan has Sharan Hojin Nihon Ongaku Chosakuken Kyokai the Japanese Society for Rights of Authors, Composers, and Publishers, also known as JASRAC. JASRAC does all the same things that a performing rights organization in the U.S. does. They handle licensing, royalties, and enforcement for huge numbers of artists. But there are a couple of important differences. The first one is that for most of its history, JASRAC was effectively a monopoly. They were the only organization of their kind authorized to operate in Japan. And second, Unlike the US ones, they handle adaptation rights, and they handle synchronization rights. Oh. And in the 1980s, there was no opting out. If you wanted to entrust your copyright to JASRAC, you had to give them everything, every right. And at that point, you did not have control over it anymore. So, Sadaka entrusted his library of music copyrights to JASRAC for administration within Japan. And so when Tomino and Sunrise decided they wanted to adapt three of Sadaka's songs for use in Zeta Gundam, they could simply go to JASRAC and license the rights to use the songs. It was all good and legal, and no one at the time seriously thought Zeta would ever be released outside of Japan. <laughs> After all, Gundam's international debut in Italy ended abruptly and somewhat ignominiously. Bandai's dream of a Hollywood Gundam movie had just gone up in smoke, and we are still 15 years away from Gundam's first debut in the US. Zeta itself would not get an official release until 2004, a release that, by the way, came after years of delays that were at least partly caused by Bandai's failed attempts to get US licenses for the three Sadaka songs. I have seen some fans assert that this was a case of Bandai being either lazy and not trying to get the licenses, or cheap and not willing to pay for the licenses. But A, that doesn't sound plausible, and B, I have it on good authority that they did inquire with Sadaka's representatives, and they received a polite but firm no thank you. <laughs> And I have to speculate that this is because Sadaka just doesn't like the Tomino adaptations. And I call them the Tomino adaptations, by the way, because the lyrics were definitely written by Tomino under his pseudonym Rin Ayogi. Sadaka is no stranger to licensing his music for TV and movie soundtracks. He has 160 soundtrack credits on IMDb, and he wrote songs for other artists for most of his career, so it's not like he's got a problem with that part. But the Tomino adaptations are more than a little different from the Sadaka originals. The lyrics are very different, of course, but so is the overall sound of the songs. I'm not, like, a music expert, but when I listen to Tokyo Koete next to Better Days Are Coming, I can't really hear the one and the other, except it may be a couple of points if I'm really, really listening for it. That's unusual. For an adaptation, I mean. Yeah. Well, let me play you a little bit of each one of them. This okay. is Zeta Tokyo Koete. Cool. This was the original opening song. Okay. One, two, three, four. Yeah, very different. This is actually making me think of the Persona music. <laughs> I suppose I can kind of feel it in the tempo. 
and the underlying music mm-hmm. with just completely different instrumentation, right? Yeah. Okay. And the other two are similar. So maybe this is the whole problem. Neil Sedaka just wanted people to know that better days were coming and sunshine was going to clear up the weather. It seems he has little concern for those of us of a noble mind who want to have a pure time and believe in the sign of Zeta. Next time on episode 2.3, A Boy Named Sue, we will cover Zeta Gundam episode 2, Departure, and talk about hurt people hurting people. The Aug, Birdlime. Hello, Zach. Not Frog gets a name, and it's Fa. A guy I'm calling New Slegger. Machine porn. What's the plan here? So, you got no plan. Chansu. And I guess you could say that the future of this series is looking bright. Hey, you. <laughs> you will see the tears of time. Remember to do all of the podcast things. Subscribe and review Mobile Suit Breakdown wherever you get your podcasts. Then pledge your undying devotion to Mobile Suit Breakdown on Patreon, where you can find great bonus content, get access to the MSB Discord, get exclusive MSB merchandise, and, you know, support the podcast. You can also follow at Gundam Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and like us at facebook.com slash Gundam Podcast for all kinds of extra content. And you should always check out our website, GundamPodcast.com, for all of our episodes, show notes, watch list, wish list, some other lists, and more. Plus, you can always email your questions, comments, and complaints to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. Or just shout your wrong Gundam opinions to us in person by coming to scenic New York City and yelling, The name Mark II for the new Gundam mobile suit is a subtle reference to the fact that Zeta is actually the second Gundam show on any busy street corner. We'll totally hear you. The intro song is Wasp by Misha Dioxin, and the closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. You can find links and more in the show notes. And thank you for listening. This episode, I'm a little more. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I made a mistake. This was all a mistake. (laughs) Don't say that. (laughs) Not true. (laughs) Notes situated. Getting all my notes situated. I love the Getting My Notes Situated song. It's one of my favorite songs. I will happily. Just like Baby Shark, do 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 do. Baby oh. Shark, do 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 do. You're slightly off tempo, but also. I always am. <laughs> That's kind of my brand here. <laughs> uh, I saw a tweet this morning that I thought was kind of sounded kind of amazing to me. A guy in a Tesla uh, with like clouds of vape smoke in there with him <laughs> blasting Baby Shark <laughs> at 8 in the morning. <laughs> Alright, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I love it. There's the one that shot <laughs> oh no! I looked. I, th- up- I think you have to describe what the burp gun is because sure. it is not what it sounds like. That was my ankle. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> you might want to redo. Yeah, that. I'm gonna redo that. You're like, what was that clicking? Oh God. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> That's the end. It's a good I'm end. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting. Do you know if it's called the same thing in Japanese animation? No, I have no Do idea. Queening? Probably Queening. not. <laughs> that would be a little odd. <laughs>